Hi, this is Anthony. Welcome back to my show and Happy New Year. As the new year begins, I want to return to a degree back to the roots of this channel, which was talking about personal finance and occasionally how to make money from side hustles. One of my guilty pleasures is watching other channels such as Caleb Hammer's Financial Audits, where he takes a tough love approach to people with disastrous finances. However, the people that come on his show really don't seem to be that extreme. Unfortunately, they represent a large cross-section of American society. And that's unfortunate that so many people, including high earners, often live paycheck to paycheck. But I think that many people often have more wealth or assets than they realize. That money or value is just not deployed effectively. So this is the first of a series that I'll call Unleash Your Wealth. And I'm going to try to keep them short and look at one small thing at a time. And hopefully if you're somebody who finds themselves living from paycheck to paycheck, some of these tips and tricks may be of use to you. And if they are, or if they're not, please do leave a comment in the comment section and share your thoughts or your successes. Since I'm touching upon the subject of finance, I want to point out I'm not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. It's just entertainment. But I think it's entertainment that you can probably glean something useful from. And there's not one piece of financial advice or entertainment that is right for everybody in the world. In Western industrialized countries with fairly low inflation, obviously somebody spending less money than they make so that they have a surplus each month generally makes economic sense. But if you live in a high inflation economic system where your money will be worth dramatically less at the end of the month, then it makes sense to immediately spend your money to buy non-perishable food or items like that because they will retain their value. So my audience tends to be from the United States and then the next few countries are Canada, the United Kingdom, and Australia. Again, whatever I say here, make sure that it is right for you in your own situation. Today I want to look at Starbucks or any other beverage chain like that. For instance, here in Oregon where I live, we also have Dutch Bros and that's the way that they pronounce it. It's not Dutch Brothers. Now, when I was in high school, nobody stopped at any place and picked up drinks except for a few kids who would stop at 7-Eleven and buy a big gulp so that they could put bourbon in it. But a while back, I worked at a high school, and of the students who drove themselves to school, extremely large numbers of them walked in carrying Dutch Bros drinks. And I think that we all know people who go to Starbucks on a regular basis, perhaps a couple times a day, certainly many times a week. And let's not get into any philosophical discussions about large corporations or what country they may support in the Middle East. I don't care about any of that. That has no bearing on the financial issues that we're going to look at here. But obviously, if you have some philosophical issue with any company beyond your personal finances, then that's your own decisions to make. So hopefully I'm preaching to the choir here and you're not a chronic consumer of these beverages. But I think that we all know people who are. And at least out here, their drinks are going to be an average of about $5. Obviously, there's going to be some that are a little less and some that are a lot more. And they may have pastries that people may buy. And a lot of people go in once a day during the work week. But a lot of people probably go on the way to work and then sometimes maybe on the way home. That certainly is what I've seen at my local Starbucks. But... At a very minimum, I think that we could say that there's a lot of people who go to Starbucks once a day, every day of the week, and spend $5 a day. This makes the math and calculations just easier. And $5 doesn't seem like a lot, but, at the, but the point of this video is to show how it can add up. And I want to be clear, I'm not against drinking coffee. I drink a lot of coffee. But I go to my local discount supermarket and for $8 I can buy a large can, can of ground coffee that will usually last me at least six weeks and that's drinking multiple cups a day. Let's just do the math here for a minute. Now I think sometimes some coffee shops will maybe give you free refills but let's say instead I went to a Starbucks in the morning every day of the week and a, got a $5 coffee. And then in the evening, I did the same thing on the way home. That's $10 a day for 45 days, since that's roughly a month and a half. That comes to $450 that I would have spent at Starbucks for what only cost me $7.99 to make it home. 
and I didn't even intend to do those numbers. My intention was to show you what a single cup of $5 coffee every day would cost you. And over the course of a year, that would be $1,825. And that's a single cup of basically their average coffee, not anything too special. That's not including a pastry or a sandwich that you might get. Why not think about your own expenses at a place like Starbucks? Whip out your phone and use the calculator to calculate your own expenses there. Maybe you only go Monday through Friday, but you always get a large coffee and a donation. It costs you eight and a half dollars. And let's say that you work 50 weeks a year with a couple weeks off for vacation. That's still eight dollars and fifty cents times five days a week times 50 weeks. That comes to two thousand one hundred and twenty five dollars a year. I think as you can see from these exercises, those little expenses when they're reoccurring can really add up. And I'm not saying never go to a place like that. No, not at all. I think that if you're writing the great American novel and you're going to get it published and make money on it and you need a quiet place to work and there's not a public library nearby and you can't do it at home and you have to go to Starbucks and you could sit there for four hours working on your novel while you drink your $5 cup of coffee you're basically renting space from them at $1.25 an hour, and I think that that's a good value for you. If you meet somebody online and you want to go on a cheap date in a public venue, spending $10 for two cups of coffee for you and your date is not a bad deal. Certainly cheaper than going out to a restaurant for dinner. If you have a business where you work from home and you need to meet clients from time to time face to face, Meeting them at a Starbucks and spending $5 or $10 on coffee, again, is perhaps a prudent expense. And if you get a handful of Starbucks gift cards for Christmas or your birthday and you want to meet up with an old friend who you haven't seen in a while and have coffee there, also a good use of your gift cards or money. I'm not saying that there aren't reasons why somebody should go to Starbucks. I'm just cautioning people about long-term costs that many people occur uh, get there. Okay, so maybe you've made the resolution this year that you're cutting out Starbucks and going to save that money, hopefully. And there's no sense cutting out Starbucks than just going to McDonald's even more. And by the way, my understanding is coffee of any size is quite a bit cheaper at McDonald's. If you absolutely have to get coffee through a drive-in, then you might think about McDonald's instead of Starbucks. And again, if you're driving home late at night and the drive home is an hour long and you're sleepy, Getting a $5 cup of coffee to stay awake is certainly worth it. So again, take my advice with a grain of salt as it pertains to your particular situation. Okay, so if you're going to save your $1,825 per year or whatever the amount is, and it's honestly likely a lot more, what should you do with it? Again, not financial advice, but if you have credit card debt that you're paying interest on, that's probably the first thing that you should pay down with your extra savings. And again, I'm not going to run through every scenario. Look at your own life and figure out what would it best be sent on. But let's say that you don't have any high interest debts. Maybe you have a mortgage, but it's at 4%. Well, what about retirement? A lot of people don't have any retirement funds saved up. Even if you do and you expect some Social Security, you can probably put away more. I know a lot of people are scared of the stock market. They don't know much about it, except it sometimes goes down. They've heard from their grandparents about the Great Depression. There's all kinds of reasons why people don't put money into the stock market. Maybe they did, but they put it in on a high-flying stock that ended up going bankrupt years ago, and so they've been burned and don't want to do it again. Maybe they've invested in crypto and lost it all. But I think when you look at the history of the United States, if you put money into a mutual fund or funds that broadly tracks the overall stock market in the United States, you should do well over the long term. If you don't panic sell when it goes down and then wait until it goes back up to its peak before you buy back in and then it goes down again. But on average, if you were invested in say the S&P 500, which includes American companies that do business in other countries, so you're not just getting the American economy, but the whole world economy here, you could probably expect a reasonable average of 8% per year. Now, generally, the return isn't exactly 8%. It may be 4% one year, and then 12% the next year, and then 20% the next year, and then down 12% the year after that. 
That's why one should have a long-term target. But let's say that instead of buying your Starbucks coffee, you saved up the money and you put $5 into a jar each day and maybe here and there you put a little extra that was pocket change left over from the grocery store or you returned some recyclable cans. So let's say that you had $2,000 at the end of the year which again is not an unreasonable amount for you to be able to save if you're spending $5 on average a day at Starbucks or Dutch Bros. Let's say that you put that $2,000 into an S&P 500 fund that on average grew 8%. How much would you have after 20 years? And 20 years may seem like a long time when you're young, but when you're old, you realize how quickly that can go and you realize that you have a jar of ketchup in your fridge that expired 20 years ago. Anyway, by filling in some information on NerdWallet, which I've never used, but it just came up randomly in my results, it shows that a single contribution of $2,000 at 8% expected average rate of return for 20 years would result in you having $9,322 at the end. What if you were able to contribute $2,000 a year at the same estimated return for 20 years? That would give you over $100,000. And let's say we're only looking at one measure of the cost of you buying that $5 cup of coffee, a single cup, instead of you investing the money. One way to look at it is your $5 cup of coffee is costing you $23 for something that literally would cost you probably 23 cents to make it home. And let's say that you're a high school student and you're 17 years old and you plan to retire at 65. Now as a 17 year old you probably are going to think that you'll never make it to 65, but you probably will. Anyway, that's 48 years until retirement. So let's change the years of growth to 48 in our example. And here your $5 cup of coffee is actually costing you $201 in lost potential gains. And the great thing about the year 2024 is that there's so many options where you can put money into fractional shares of mutual funds with zero commission which we couldn't do when I was your age. And I encourage you to go to NerdWallet or any other online calculator and play around with different numbers and see how much things really cost over the long run. Anyway, I'm going to end now. I'll be making more videos along these lines soon. I really would love to hear from you. I think these numbers are often incredible when you put them into online calculators. And I certainly understand if you're living paycheck to paycheck, things can be tough. It can be hard to set aside money there's always things that come up, but if you can tighten your belt here and there, there's usually more money than what you think. Okay, please do hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Hopefully you'll hit the like button if you find this content interesting. And please do leave a comment, whether it's a few words or a couple paragraphs. I eventually read them all and I appreciate them. Thanks so much.